My name's Marae Dunn. I am a professor in the sociology of education, and I have worked in the Centre for International Education for a long time. Um, um, in terms of the master's programme that uh, I teach on, well, I teach on the master's programme and I teach two main um, modules. The first one is called theories, which is a core module in the first term. And luckily this year we did it face to face. Um, and I teach on one which is called uh, Gender Identities and Citizenship, and we call it magic because it's a, a magic um, module. I also teach an undergraduate program called uh, Decolonizing Education, Knowledge, Power and Society. Um, just so that you know. I have to say too, that this is rather odd. Not only am I not seeing people, not physically, that I'm actually talking to myself and James and Kazuki online. So if it feels a bit odd to you too, it feels worse for me. But anyway, the idea here is, um, first of all, to welcome you and I will um, go through um, a, a small, a short lecture, but, uh, but in the sense, were you to come onto the MA, um, often in lectures, we don't, we don't do lectures, if you like, we do workshops. So we have interactive sessions. There is input from the lecturers, obviously, but then we try to get communal learning within inside um, each of the modules that we do, um, even, even in theories. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so here we go. Um, so education and development, that's what I'm talking about today. Um, and this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm Professor Murray Dunn and off we go. What am I going to do today? I'm going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to talk about what's development. I'm going to talk about what is education. I'm going to talk about what else is important. I'm going to talk about particularly about the relationship to society and knowledge and to decolonization. And of course, I hope to leave time for questions. Like many lecturers, I've got the capacity to talk for a very long time, and I hope to curb that a little bit today. Okay, so the question is, what is development? Even if we're interested in education and development, we need to uh, go to the question, what is development? And we need to ask ourselves, because you know the idea that you're coming or interested in, in a in a, um, a master's program in education and development would suggest that you've got some experience with it, would suggest that you are interested in it in some way. And for lots of people, particularly in education, it's because they've got a hope of change. Um, it may not be changed to themselves, it may be changed to other people. But um, I can remember when I worked in Kenya for some time, uh, People would ask me, oh, what did you do? What did you change when you got there? And I had to say the biggest thing that I changed was me. Um, so it's the way I thought about what was going on in development and what that meant about the possibilities of change. So in this case, we're asking the question, what does it mean to call a country developed or developing? What, what, is it only about economics? What other aspects are important? What else do we have to think about? Why do we want to make some countries more developed? And why are developed or high income countries involved in this process? What's in it for them? So those are critical key questions. And I'm now going to try to do a little uh, poll um, and I would need to stop sharing for a minute and I'm going to put a, a link in the chat room. You click on that link and you can put in all the words that you think of related to the term development. Um, let's hope this works. Hold on for a moment and I will put the term in the chat room.
Okay. I want you to click on that and it should bring up a, a question for you. What is development? And just put all the terms. Don't worry about it. Just throw them in there. Um, and I'll, um, we'll have a look, see what we think development is. And that applies to everybody who's listening now. Put as many words as you can in that chat box. And let's have a look what's coming up. Can you see that? James, can we see that? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, more words, you want more words in there. <laughs> Equality, economic, transformation, social. Let's have more words. I'm assuming everybody's able to see the link. Yes, yeah, working fine, thank you. Okay, there's not many words coming in. Well, we've got four words so far, five, good. Any more? Poverty, okay. All right, I'm going to um, stop that now for a minute. Oh, well, maybe I should give you a little bit more time. Keep going. Great. Economic, equal opportunity, poverty, equality, access, power, social transformation. All right. Okay, I've stopped sharing now. Um, and let me go back. Right, the idea is that we've got lots of different ideas about what development is. And if we're looking at education and development, we actually need to think, if we think of education for development, what is development about? What is um, the whole process of development that education can support? Okay, going back to the um, screen. Can you see that? Can you see it? Yes, you can. Sorry, struggling to find my mute button. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. All right. So let's move on then. I found it. Wrong. Apologies, I'm stalling a bit, or it's juddling. Okay. Well, just as we might um, have those ideas of what is development, there are people who are ready to tell us what development is. Um, and here I'm looking at the UNDP re report. It's the Human Development Report, and it's produced annually. Um, and what it does is it lists countries and it produces what's called a human development index. And this human development index is used um, to put countries in four levels of human development. Very high, which most European countries are in, high, medium, and low. And if you look at those countries in low development, you'll see many of them come from what we would call low income countries, from what people colloquially call uh, um, developing countries. Interestingly enough, in order to make this number, the Human Development Index, there are four indicators. Life expectancy, 
expected years of schooling, mean years of schooling, and gross national income per capita. So how, what's the income of the country per capita? What's important here is that two of those four indicators are related to education. So even for those people trying to calculate what development is, education is really, really important. The second thing that we need to look at here, or maybe the third, is that they list countries in hierarchical order. So that you get something like this. Sorry, it's not very clear, but I'll go through it with you. This is the Human Development Index rank. And it starts at the top with countries like Norway and interestingly, Ireland, thank goodness, uh, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Iceland. So these are very high human development. And then it goes right the way down through four ranks and the lowest rank is low human development. And it lists countries here like Mauritania, Benin, Uganda, and Rwanda. There are countries lower, it goes down to 170 something countries, but I've only listed those ones for you. And what we have here is the value, the human uh, development in index calculated from life expectancy, expected years of schooling, mean years of schooling, and gross national income per capita. And what it tells us is what is the HDI rank, which we've got listed down here in that hierarchical order. And it tells us what was the rank last time. And so here we can see Ireland, for example, was three last time and it's come to number two. So there are people um, in the world and great big international bodies like the UN who are prepared to tell us what development is. And if we look at the fundamental basis of what they're talking about, they're saying that there are lots of countries, and here I've got uh, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Bolivia, who are low, uh, low developing countries, less developed countries. And the idea is that they do things that make them into higher developing countries countries with very high development indicators. So we've got the UK, Great Britain there, the US, Europe, and Japan. And so there's a sense in which what they're meaning about development is a, an idea of progress from those things that happen in countries that make them low-income countries to look like those countries that are listed there. So there's a sense of this unending idea of progress that can happen. Okay, so now we've got the same question. I won't bother going to the um, poll. I could do it, but I won't do that. So we've had a kind of taste of what some people are talking about, what development is. We really need to think about what is education? What is it for? Who is it for? Is it for jobs? What is it for? Is it so that we're literate? Is it so that we understand the world we live in a bit better? What is it for? Why do countries provide education? What kinds of education do they provide? How is it provided and what is included? I mean, we can look across the world and we can see that the dominant way in which education is provided is through these institutions called schools, where we put children or young people in rooms with somebody older than them, a teacher, who's supposed to tell them things or supposed to help them learn, maybe tell them things is not the right idea. But that model of how education is provided is ubiquitous. Okay, so th that question of what is education for and how countries provide education is really important. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that that model of education is throughout the world? How has history shaped, the, shaped the, the form of education? So if you look in the UK context, for example, we know that the model of education came from religious schools, schools for religious academics. And then it was rolled out to the sons of elite people. And then it's gradually rolled out in all its ways um, to everybody. So we've got a place, a state in the UK where everybody has to be at school. In fact, it's illegal not to send children to school. 
that isn't the case everywhere. But the history that has shaped education is really important. And of course, at the end of it all, because we're probably interested in education in a big way, we do have asked to ask the question, what does it mean to be educated? Okay. However, once we sorted out the question of what's development and what is education, we need to think, how do they link together? What is it that development does for education and education does for development? Luckily, again, we have got somebody who can tell us. Um, we've got the, the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17. I've left a link in there um, because the link will take you to each of those. Um, sorry that the um, PowerPoint size is not that clear, but if we look here, we can see we've got one that's specifically related to education. So sustainable development at the heart of it somewhere has got education goals. And I would suggest that if you go through all of these other goals, um, that you would find that education is at the heart of all of them. How do we get safe water? How do we get decent work? How do we get no hunger? You know, how do we deal with climate change? All of those things demand an educational side to them. They cannot be done without education. Okay, so let's have a look. I'm gonna give you a quick summary of, of the goal four, sustainable goal four, which says ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning. And basically this SDG is about getting access to all levels of schooling from preschool to university. It's about not only getting into school, it's about the quality of education. It's about what are the learning outcomes. We have a situation where there are children going to school in some places, but they don't ever achieve the learning outcomes they're supposed to. In other words, they may come out of the school and not be literate and not be numerate. Um, um, so those things become really important, the quality and learning outcomes. They should have skills for work. There should be equal access. And this is talked about in terms of gendered access. There should be literacy and numeracy and all that education should give us are sustainable livelihoods, knowledge of rights, equality, peace and global citizenship. And this is all to be done by 2030. I'm moving on to one of the other goals because the education goal, if we look at the text of it, refers to gender as one of the key indicators of equality. So I'm looking at gender and I'm also very interested in gender myself as we all are going around every day performing our gender identities. But the idea here is that we should stop discrimination, violence, FGM and early marriage. All of these things need education to support them. We should value unpaid care and domestic work. Not only people going out and getting jobs and money in, but there's unpaid care, the responsibility of which is lo loaded mostly on women. We should share responsibilities. Um, and that doesn't mean to say as a, as a male, you do the washing up once. It means that you take responsibility for what goes on. Um, we need to offer social protection. And we need to enable women in particular, although this is, applies to everybody, because gender isn't only about women, it's about men as well. Um, we need to enable participation, leadership, decision-making, and sexual and reproductive health rights. But of course, there is more. We can't only think about development and education by just looking at those two bubbles. We need to think how they're connected and there's more than that. We need to understand, and I've, I've got this little acronym desk to help us uh, think about what we do need to understand. Yes, we need to have an idea of development. Yes, we need to have an idea of education, but we also need to have an idea of society. How does society go on? How does society go on at the global level, at the local level? How do relations go on between people? How do institutions like the family, like schools in particular, influence society? 
what kind of place and space and context does this all happen in? And does that make a difference? Do we think of society as individual people or are we looking at as groups? How are we understanding society? And the next thing we have to do, and especially because we're in education, we need to think about knowledge. We need to think about whose knowledge? How do we get knowledge? How do we produce evidence? What kind of research is there? Um, and so what we, need to, what we need to say to ourselves is that if we want to study and understand education and development, we need to think about the explicit and implicit theories. We need to think about development, education, society, and knowledge. And I'll talk a little bit about those explicit and implicit theories in a moment. Um, so there are more, it's, there's much more to think about. And I guess the idea here is that if we want to connect education development, we also need to see how society and understanding of society link education and development. How do questions ab about society influence ideas about education, about development, and about the links between all of them? Many people come into development thinking about social change. They come into education thinking about social change. In those senses, we've got to understand society if we're interested in that. So let's have a look at society. How do we understand society? Is it made of individuals, groups? How do they relate to each other? Um, I started with an idea about gender. We might think about how the binary gender groups interrelate with each other? What is the difference between how men and women relate to each other? How men carry on their lives, how women carry on their lives, or the expectations of what they do? What social institutions are important in shaping society and social relations and differences between them? So for example, staying with the idea of gender, although it could be other things, you know, I've done some research where I go into schools in different parts of the world, including the UK, and I look at how the school expects different things from girls and boys and how it expects that binary division of male and female. What's it expecting? I mean, it isn't long and it still is the case in many places, for example, that your sex at birth, it seems to be an indicator of what kind of uniform we should wear. So we're marking differences of gender in schools and in our daily life. And we do that at home. And I, I would always say to people, you know, in my parents' home, if visitors come in to the house, I am the one and my sisters are the ones who are gonna jump up and serve them tea, food, whatever it is, my brothers will just sit there and chat. What that is doing is showing me that as a female, this is what ex is expected of me. So the institution of the family is really important in shaping how we act in society. And of course, here we are talking about culture in some way. How is culture related to social activity and social difference? And the key questions for us sociologists looking at society is who and what is powerful in societies? Is it the government? Is it the local MP? Is it the local chief? Is it the priest or the imam? Who is it? Who is the most important? And what difference does that make with how societies go on? Of course, importantly, we don't just talk about now, we have to think about historically how we've come to be like this. How is it in the UK that more than half our politicians come from Oxford and Cambridge University and more than a third of them have been educated in fee paying schools? We've got a history that has allowed social class divisions to sediment. So when we're looking at societies, we can't just take the picture now, we have to understand historical legacies. Um, 
And we have to think about, particularly when we're interested in development, about the different ways in which developed and developing countries connect to each other. What does the, what does the history of society, how does the history of a society make a difference? The histories of many countries include colonialism. My country does, which is Ireland, and it's still there, but so do lots of countries in what we might call the global south. Lots of low income countries have got a history of colonialism. And that colonialism, I would say, is deeply linked to an idea of capitalism. The capitalist system um, is one that has been produced, and if you like, influenced the social life inside countries in the global south. So it is not only that they affect societies, they also affect what education is about. When we see that education is valued for its, its um, for the way in that, in that allows people to get jobs, we can see that the idea of putting money into education so people come and make money sounds to be um, quite significant in terms of having a capitalistic mentality about the value of schooling. We will return to this shortly, but we now need to look at knowledge. So as a whole, we've gone development, we've looked at education, just asking questions, what do we think about it? And now we have to think about knowledge because we have got lots of people telling us from the United Nations to the World Bank, to the IMF, telling us how much we should spend on education, what education should include and what it doesn't have to include, what knowledge is important. We all have the opportunity to learn calculus in school. We all have the opportunity to learn graphs or to know um, about how uh, parts of the body work, for example. There are things that we learn at school that are quite abstract. I think that's a good thing, actually. But why is it learning calculus seems to be a higher priority than learning how to grow your food or learning how to cook food? There are lots of people in the world, and I won't describe what gender they are, who, who cannot really cook. So but they can do calculus, but they can't cook. What is it that makes the knowledge of calculus more important than learning how to grow and cook food? Just questions. Because we are interested in education, we are actually parceling and packaging knowledge. That's what education systems do. So who decides which knowledge is important? And we can see if we go back to the human development report that I was showing you earlier, that those people in, uh, in UNDP are producing knowledge about all the countries in the world. And we have to think about who's producing that knowledge. Why are they producing it? How are they producing it? In whose interest is it to have some countries in very high human development and other countries in low human development. And in collecting that knowledge, what has been excluded? Whose views have been included and excluded? And I'll give you a lovely quote from Foucault here. Power produces knowledge. UNDP has power. Power and knowledge directly imply one another. There is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. Power and knowledge are linked. Nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. It is the powerful that produce knowledge. And it is that knowledge that gets included in the school curriculum and given um, much more primacy than other knowledge. So we have to think about how that is. And of course, we've got now views from the global south 
because all that all the issues in the history of colonialism have produced views about what development is have produced views about what education is now they are produced largely in the global north in the very rich countries of the global north in the powerful countries of the global north however we have voices from the south um, in inverted commas and um, one of the great voices early on in the post-war period when lots of countries uh, were getting independence. Kwame Nkrumah was the uh, president of Ghana, which was the first African country to get independence. And he became slightly soured because although he was newly independent, he, he, dis he said that we, we haven't got colonialism in the way we knew it, but we've got neo-colonialism. And what that does, it gives us aid. It produces unequal trade. And here we sit still to today, drinking tea and coffee and cocoa and chocolate very cheaply because we have fixed how much that is worth in the market. We fix the prices of how much commodity is worth. And that means that we, we are actually feeding off the backs of the cheap labor of people in the global south. Um, so he wasn't only talking about financial he hegemony, he was also talking about cultural dominance, the cultural dominance of the West. Um, and I can remember um, working in Kenya, and I also worked in the Pacific in Fiji, um, where I'd come back from Ireland or England, and I'd have a new cardigan or something. And people would really want that cardigan. Even if it was somewhere like Primark, a really cheap shop, because it came from the UK. There was something about valuing it because it came from the UK, even though it had come from somewhere else before that. Uh, so there's something about the cultural dominance of the West. I mean, can look at that in literature, we can look at it in music, we can look at it in forms of dance, the cultural dominance of the West is what Kwame Nkrumah was talking about when he was saying, we may be independent, but we're actually deeply, in the, we're deeply dependent. We're in a, we're in a state of neo-colonialism. And here is uh, Mahmoud, uh, a writer saying, the age of colonial expansion of Europe also saw the consolidation of history the union linear progressive Eurocentric teleological history, that graph that I showed you earlier, as the dominant mode of experience of time and being. In history, time overcomes space. So we forget about context, we're just looking at time. How much can you develop in the next 10 years? We've got that in the SDGs. A process whereby the geographically distant other is supposed to, in time, become what, like oneself. Europe's present becomes the other's future. And often we see this when people are talking about development. They're, they're implicitly thinking about when will a country like Bangladesh become like the UK? When will a country like Bolivia be like Spain? When, when will those things happen? We've got an implicit theory that development means becoming like the richer countries of the globe. And not only are we talk, have, we, have we got commentators from the South who are talking about how colonial relations have deeply affected society, we have got other writers, um, Oyeumi, a Nigerian writer, talking about the way that the colonial legacy and its capitalist system produced gendered modernity. Interests, concerns, predilections, neurosis, prejudices, social institutions and social categories of Euro-Americans Euro have dominated the writing of human history. So most writers who talk about history uh, are from Euro-American Euro origin. One effect of this Eurocentrism is the racialization of knowledge. 
Europe is represented as the source of knowledge and Europe as knowers. Indeed, male gender privilege as an essential part of European ethos is enshrined in the culture of modernity. This global context for knowledge production must be taken into account in our quest to understand African realities and indeed the human condition. So the very ideas, this idea of development itself has legacies that have produced what Oyeumi would talk about a skewed knowledge and skewed knowledge that has entrenched a gender division. Um, and so let's go back to Foucault for this because we're interested in education, we're interested in how knowledge, education and power are linked. Every educational system is a political means of maintaining or modifying the appropriateness of discourses with the knowledge and power they bring with them. So it's not a simple thing of people learning history or learning geography or learning maths. There's something that's deeply imbued in knowledge in the knowledge that we are value that has a legacy of colonialism in it. So colonial knowledge, education and power may have become post-colonial and that word has multiple meanings. Um, so the, the challenge for us now is to decolonize knowledge, education and power because we know that the historic roots of knowledge comes from those people who are powerful and in periods of colonialism and in its aftermath, we are talking about the hegemony of North America and, and Northwestern Europe. And of course, we're not without writers to talk about this. I, I give you a whole plethora of people here who um, have something to say. And, and we can have a quick flick through them. We have got Franz Fanon, who talked about the internalized oppression um, for black people. We've got people like Linda Smith, who talks about decolonizing methodologies. That's really important because it's about how we make knowledge. That's Oyoumi there, Gugi Wathiongo, Edward Said, who talked about the other, how the story of the West made those people orientals from a different place. We've got uh, Ayo Koli, Gugiwa Thiongo, Homi Baba, Mahanda Chan, uh, Chan, Mahanti, Chandra Mahanti, sorry, um, who talked about being under Western eyes. Um, we've got D'Souza Santos, Ayo Koli, Spivak, um, and we've got down here Mignolo, and gosh, Who's that now? Oh, that is Bell Hooks. It's a different picture than I'm used to. But we've got people from the South who are writing about what it is, what is what's important about their knowledge. And if we're interested in education and development, we have to understand not only their experiences, but their point of view. Otherwise, um, why would we be um, in academia? Um, this slide is supposed to come in a beautiful way. Maybe I'll try and make it. Okay. So if you're looking at education and inter international development, often people come in because they're interested in practice and they may also be interested in policy. And those things are supposed to help education and development. We've got lots of people who want to do teaching better, who want to teach teachers better, who want schools to be better, who want to make policy that enables that better. But what I have to say to you is that we can't do that unless we theorize it. If we have theories of what education is that are not up to the job or that just pull on colonial knowledge, it's not going to do anything. It is not, as people would say, fit for purpose. It is just going to reproduce uh, the subordination of peoples of the South, if you like, and even peoples of the South who live in the North. And often when we're focusing on practice, on policy, we sometimes forget theory. 
And that's why we have some half-baked ideas of development projects that um, some development actors produce to go into the global south. For example, and I'll return to my gender example, if we have an idea of gender being the same as sex at birth and of gender just being a binary and there's no issues about sexual identity, culture and society, when we make policy to address gender differences, we are not going to be making the right policy. Because if you've got that such a simplistic view of what gender is and how it operates in society, the policy we produce is going to produce practice that will probably reinstate that gender binary that we are actually trying to escape, desperately trying to escape from. Okay. And having said that about theory, I'm going to give you a quote from the lovely Judith Butler to say, theory is an activity that does not remain restricted to the academy. It takes place every time a possibility is imagined. A collective self-reflection takes place. A dispute over values, priorities and language emerges. I believe there is an important value in overcoming the fear of imminent critique and to maintaining the democratic value of producing a movement that can contain, without domesticating, conflicting interpretations on fundamental issues. Um, so here we have an idea of um, what theory does. It's not something out there. It's in the implicit, it's implicit in every action that we take every day. We have a theory of something. We need to try and think about those and make them explicit. Okay, I'll finish there. And uh, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll open it up to um, questions. If anyone has any questions at all, um, please write those either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Yeah, there is no such thing as a silly question. If you've got a question, it's a question for you. Just get it out there. We'll talk. And it, it is an example of, um, is this part of one of the modules that you'd encounter in the first term as well, in the first semester, or, or how, how would this work? Um, <clears throat> I would say, I mean, I don't normally do a half an hour lecture, well, <laughs> half an hour, but, you know, I don't normally do it like that. Um, you know, some of those, yeah, I mean, this comes at the beginning of theories, and theories is the first core module. We have theories and policies in the first term. And this is just to start to um, get everybody talking. Because I think one of the most important things about the MA is it's not about being told something. It's about you trying to articulate what you think. Um, and often what you think in the first place or even the second place, you disagree with it. You know, two days later, you'll think, oh no, that wasn't quite right. And, and that is absolutely fine. But the issue here is that we have to start to articulate it. And once we start to articulate, which is why we try to do um, bits of group work, get people talking to each other, so you can practice what you're thinking and connect your views about education, if you like, with development or the other way around, or connect the ideas about education and its um, implications for society. And say to yourself, what kind of knowledge do should we be producing for different different places? So yeah, so it's part of a first um, it's part of a first session in theories. It's part of that without the interaction. Do you find that um, students' definition and their own theories that they come into in the classroom? Do you find that changes significantly yes. through the course? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, lots of people come in because they want to help, they want to support, they want to change something. And all of that is fantastic. But we've got to, um, but we've got to think about how our view of something links to a context uh, that we might be interested in or, or that we have a connection with. And these questions are hard. They're not easy questions. They're really hard questions. Um, but as the Butler quote is saying, you know, we need to have, you know, some of those questions so we can have the debate so that we can, you know, uh, 
develop our own thinking. I, th I think that's the theme we've seen throughout this week, I think, from alumni and current students, I think, is it's how all of the courses, I think, have challenged their definitions, their conventions, their theories as well. And I think your lecture's been really particularly great at tying up probably all the week we've had, because I think everyone can see that central theme of decolonization and sort of yeah. how essentially it's hardwired into Sussex courses, not only in what we described development, but, you know, I, I studied history at Sussex and that was an integral part of it as yeah. well. So um, it's, yeah, it's a really passionate thing. And I think it's been brought to light by your lecture and also what each of our students have been talking about. So um, we'll move over to, um, we've got another question um, from Maria. Uh, thanks very much, Maria, for your question. Um, she asks, how do you think that the education in Latin America have to change to have a significant impact in gender equality? Well, I mean, yeah, gender equality is a massive issue now. I mean, there's been lots about gender violence globally recently. Uh, it, it's it's a massive issue, um, and uh, I think that sometimes we separate gender as if it's something separate to deal with, whereas in fact it is deeply embedded in the way our societies run, um, and that's it, it really is a tough call. I think some of those protests that have gone on there to say, look, we, this is it, no more tolerance. I mean. You know, the energy and, and the hurt, actually, that has preceded that, you know, at one level is terrifying, but that it comes onto a public arena, that people can um, hold on to it, that it, it is a public agenda item. There's been a history where issues of gender have been put into the private life where people don't touch them. But now those things are coming into the public agenda. And, you know, for lots of people, both men and women, this addressing of gender is, is a relief. It, it's, um, it's something that I don't think anybody would disagree with, really, if you to ask them, really. Um, but it takes energy, and especially when you've got repressive state forces, whether it's the police or the army, attending to it. Yeah. I mean, all power to those people. Um, I, I, I wouldn't like to advise what would, what would happen in Latin America, but it, this, um, I was in Mexico a couple of years ago at a, at a conference and you could, the people were protesting in the streets in Mexico City and it was there daily. Um, but there are also places where people are not protesting. And, and this is not, it's not only an issue for women, obviously. And there, there are lots of men who are fully supportive of that. And there are lots of women who still want to retain a global gender role difference and keep it solid and stable. Uh, whereas we, we know that we have to break that. It doesn't mean to say women can't behave as women and men can't behave as men, but we we can't roll that out for everybody. And we certainly can't have violence. Violent, you know, we certainly can't have that. It's not, whether it's physical violence, and some people would say colonialism was a, a kind of violence, where we now have schools throughout the world where children are trying to learn English. <laughs> you know, it's not their tongue and they're trying to do things through English. That's a violence. In its way, that's a violence. Sorry, I went off the track there, I think. I, 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 what I'm saying is I couldn't possibly say what should happen in Latin America. I observe it and uh, admire the effort to change. Thank you, perfect. Um, we're going to move over to a question from um, Ethan, who I think joins us, if I remember rightly, from Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ethan. Um, he says, um, as there is a global movement beginning in decolonizing curricula, uh, what is the University of Sussex approach to in integrating into this movement? Whose voices are being uplifted and highlighted at Sussex, uh, where they may have previously been silenced? Yeah, well, I, you know, I can't really speak for the whole of Sussex, of course, yeah. but, you know, um, we we have there is in inside the MA and you know inside the undergraduate courses uh, the idea of decolonization it's a very big idea because it's not only you know north meets south it's replete 
with other kinds of social assumptions about how people behave, about, you know, the idea, for example, that education is only to get a job. You know, the idea that you learn your gender position through education, and not only gender position, but others, because we've got other social divisions like class and caste and all of those things that have implications for how people imagine who they are, how we produce identities. So inside Sussex, there is a, there is a move uh, to do that. And in my effort to show whose voices are there, that slide with lots of people's faces on, let's try to say, we draw on these people in, in our course, in, in theories and in uh, um, optional module on identities, gender identity, citizenship and youth, we draw specifically on writers from the South. Um, uh, so I, I, we are very conscious of it on the MA and in education, we're becoming increasingly, sorry about that, increasingly conscious of it. Um, but it, and although it's there as a headline, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work in lots of different ways. Um, to penetrate some of the um, old uh, structures of knowledge production and education. I hope that was an answer, Ethan. Fantastic. Um, next question, Jean Lee um, says, thank you for a truly amazing, insightful presentation. I really appreciated it. I, appreciated it. I thought this MA on international education and development would focus on the ways stroke methods of education but would you say the course is rather based on the impacts of education on development and on what topics education should be based on, uh, such as gender and decolonialism for development? Um, no, you've, you've kind of got a slightly biased view because I'm doing a presentation and I, I teach on theories. And for me, that is really important. I can't bring my own unchallenged assumptions into talking about social life or educational life elsewhere. I have to challenge them and I have to hear and see the context in which that education is placed. Um, but having said that, there are um, people who will look, for example, in, um, in, the, sec in, in the first term, there's um, the other core module is about policies. And that um, module on policies looks directly about existing policies um, at, in different places and actually challenges people to develop a policy that they think will influence some kind of practice. And that practice can be a practice of teaching and learning in the classroom, or it can be something else. I mean, we're in a big field. There are massive layers that we're looking at here. So, um, so you do, you do have, even thinking about teaching and learning, we have to think about theories of learning anyway, but you can address those issues in policies more directly that relate to practice, if you like. And then into the second term, when we do the optional modules, there is an optional module on curriculum and learning, and that specifically looks at curriculum, but it also looks at uh, learner-centered pedagogy, for example. Um, and so, you know, there are places and spaces that you can navigate to uh, address the issues that you want to look at. If you want to look at teacher education, or if you want to look at language learning, uh, we have people who are on the team who have got specific interests in those things. Um, yeah, so it's a broad remit and you can navigate yourself through the modules, I think. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. A broad church and lots of different voices and approaches. Um, we've got a question, um, a broader question, really, I guess, about the course. It says, um, it says, in order to get the most out of this course and bring as much as we can do, is it better to gain some experience before embarking on a master's course like this? Um, historically, we have, we have always said that, historically. Um, it depends how invested you are uh, in your daily or social life in looking at questions of education and development. Um, 
you know, I would, I would err on the side of having a little bit of experience. But if that's impossible, and it, it may be impossible now, um, in this year, I don't know, whatever, um, then you can, um, with technology, we can get much more insight into different places than we could before. So, you know, we do have people who haven't got experience, not very many of them, but um, so just to experience another place is always good, I think, but it shouldn't prevent you if the time is right for you. It shouldn't prevent you. Fantastic, thanks for that. Um, okay, I think we've, yeah, got through the questions. If anyone has any final questions, we've probably got a few more minutes if anyone wants to drop those in the box as well. Um, we're also joined by Marcos as well, I think, if, if there's anything uh, you wanted to add or any questions you wanted to flag up as well, Marcos. Oh, and the convener, I mean, I presented earlier on the, the master, I run the master program, but uh, I do I do think it's important to, to stress what Marit uh, underpinning her lecture about the, 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 the ethos of the program, which is around the critical, are reflected as well as to to touch in different aspect of the of the field so what i do is very positive i do quant but it doesn't mean that it's equal so other people may talk about poly so it's, it's, it's a different spectrum but uh, always uh, in in the way you approach any issue they have to be with a, a critical uh, a critical lens as well as a as a decolonizing perspective no, to, to try to bring more uh, equality across the world. That, that, that's, that's, that's my, my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I should say that, um, um, that sometimes in the articulation of looking at local places, um, the idea is not to get rid of how other people collect data on it. It is to question it. But, you know, uh, there are lots of ways where we can have critical inquiry, which, which use um, quantitative data collected by other people. Um, Marcus and I have um, a couple of papers written together, which looked, uh, you know, about what's the effect of early pregnancy, for example, and you use the data to say your story. And of course, if you come onto the MA, you will have the opportunity to do your own uh, research project at the end. Um, and the students that are on, on the course now are, are coming into that phase and it's, it's a really exciting phase because they will have done assignments or they're doing assignments, but now they're saying, what is it, what is it that I really want to have a look at? And managing to do empirical work, so collecting data from people, analysing it, and those skills of research are really, really important because it, you do research and then you understand it a lot better. Um, the other thing I want to add is that besides the actual courses that also in um, CI Centre for International Education, we have seminars every week. So there's a we call it a cafe and we get speakers from outside or sometimes um, colleagues from within to talk about topical issues um, related to education and development. And then, of course, there is the wider Sussex and we've got, you know, IDS across the road and we've got Global Studies, um, who are our uh, partners in the consortium. Um, so there's lots of opportunities uh, and lots of opportunities to talk to people from places that you've never met before who have different experiences than you. Perfect, perfect summary of the course and the benefits, I think. Uh, um, Ethan says, thank you so much for your lecture. It's wonderful to get an overview of a field of education and international development. That's a way of also better understanding the, uh, the MAID programme as well. Um, so yeah, a massive thank you, Maraid, for, for taking the time to, to join us today. Give us a lecture to all of our attendees and um, yeah, and, and sort of finishing off what's been a really great week in Development Studies Week, the first time we've done this as well. And hopefully those people who've joined across the week can see sort of the broad areas and get a better idea of which specialist development course uh, they might want to, uh, to choose. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marit. Bye. See you, Marcus. Bye. Bye.